Jay McLean, baby. But the Black History Man himself is in the building. Yeah, it's in the building right about now. If you don't know, get to know. And if you don't know, where have you been for the last decade and a half? <laughs> At least kings and queens. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Uh, greetings and welcome, Brother Robin Walker. Greetings, sir. How is everybody? Greetings, sir. Everyone's well, blessed. Well, it's, it's, been a, it's been a very energised day, I will say. I think everyone would agree with that. Most definitely. I'm going to leave you in the capable hands of Sister Arima Art and Stella B. Greetings. Mr. Robin Walker, how are you, my sir? How are you doing? No, life is good. I've just come back from a Black History Tour given by Alfred Nanton. So, yeah, big things, big things. Mm -hmm. uh, so what is, what is your take right now on this current climate right now? You know, is the surge of Black entrepreneurs, Black businesses. Is this anything new or have we seen this before? Oh, uh, we do have a history of it. Um, in particular, the African-Americans created their Wall Street uh, between 1910 and 1921 in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Before that, African-Americans in North Carolina created the original Black Wall Street. Um, you had great entrepreneurs like Charles Clinton Spaulding, who was the head of the North Carolina Mutual Life Insurance, which was the biggest black business in the world. You had, obviously, the very great Madam Walker. But what's interesting about Madam Walker is most people in the black community think she was the uh, first African-American female millionaire in the world. She was the first female millionaire, full stop, forget African-American. You can check that in the Guinness Book of World Records. Now, the Guinness Book of World Records, they've got a footnote to it to say, well, she might not be, and then they presented three other women who could have beaten her to it, one of which was her business rival. So of the four women to become millionaires, two of them were African-Americans. Mm -hmm. So just let that one sink in. And we can trace it all the way back to Mansa Musa, 14th century, estimated wealth of 415 billion. Um, and this is between 1312 and 1337. So he sets a standard. Wow. I, I just want to quickly jump in because we know who you are and we give you we give you praises every time, but I just want to give you an, a, an opportunity for those who are tuning in freshly into this conversation. Can you just give them a quick and brief introduction to who you are, Robert Moore? I'm also known as the Black History Man. And what I do is I write books, I teach adult education classes, um, I work for an education charity called Croydon Supplementary Education Project. Um, I'm a former musician. And if people ask me what do I do, I classify myself as a student, uh, an educator, uh, an investor, and an entrepreneur. Fantastic. The, the author of When We Ruled, a very, very important book that I feel should be in every person of colour's uh, every African person's um, home. So, sorry, back over to you, Sister Ari, with the question. Um, yeah, Robin Walker, I just want to kind of ask, I mean, from a historical perspective, more from the the UK, you know, it's, you know, what, what we're seeing right now um, could be something that could be, that has been replicated over the years, yeah? But I want to know, is this a, are we are we peaking right now in terms of what is happening in terms of disturbance and and the reactions that we're having now? I mean, I I ask all the guests now: Are we looking at a movement or are we looking at a moment? Um, it's too early to say. But what I'm telling people is, in the period that we're in right now, we've probably got about two more weeks uh, while um, Europeans are be nice to us. So in that two week window of opportunity, we've got to get as many resources as we can because that's what it is. It's a two week window of opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, people right now are feeling kind of guilty about the killing of George Floyd. They know that they shouldn't be treating us the way they're treating us. So right now there's this kind of soul searching, but trust me, two week window of opportunity. 
three weeks time we'll be back to normal so we gonna make whatever happens happens within this period I mean, we saw, if you look back historically, I mean, we saw some dis dis disturbances, riots in Nottingham, Brixton, Broadwater Farm. Are we seeing anything different this time around? The fact that um, uh, uh, people of European extraction are, are in the thing as well, in the sense of, you know, that they've been able to get behind the Black Lives Matter uh, thing. So that's new. Yes, there were um, white people involved in the water farm and all the rest of it. But the level of involvement this time around has been quantitatively different. So I think that does represent a change. But let's be quite clear, two weeks. Right? We've got two more weeks um, before back to normal, in my opinion. Because I remember um, in my younger days when in terms of what happened in, in terms of the disturbance on Broadwater, Broadwater farm rights. In terms of um, on, the, on the economic platform and, and, and look at, looking at this economically for a moment, um, there was a lot of interest in developing and supporting black um, um, cooperatives, organizations to support um, our communities. Um, and from that birth, you know, of quite a few different organizations that some are here today and some are not here today. So I want to know is, are there any solutions that have been birthed? I mean, okay, you, you spoke about the two week window, but what is your foresight looking historically that has happened before? What what do you think we can, what we can predict going forward based on what has happened before? Well, I think we need to understand the, polit the political situation was different and I'll explain what the difference was. Um, essentially, um, black politics in the early 80s was left wing to very left wing. And so the idea then, of, for example, what the mass media was calling the loony left, the hard left, and big up to the loony left, big up to the hard left, because they were the people that actually made the changes in the 80s to create a black middle class, black people having suit and tie jobs. Um, working for the council, you know, in, in positions where you could wear a suit and a tie and you could get to use words like competencies in your daily uh, vocabulary. That kind of thing was new for Black Britain. And it was the municipal socialists um, of the far left that made that happen. People like Linda Bellos, people like Merle Amory, People that are today vilified, but actually they made a lot of stuff happen, and we have the you know big respect to that posse. And it was on, and essentially, this whole take over the local councils, which is where we start to get black heads of councils, um, and they were then able to fund the kinds of cooperatives that you're talking about. Do you see? And so what happened is, is political control was then connected to our economic development in the ways that you're talking about and on one and on the other side you also had if people just wanted to just do a job particularly the middle class job connected in some way to the council those opportunities were open because of what the far left had achieved now what's happened now is the far left are not in power anywhere um, a lot of black people the younger black people don't even know that there was such a period in our history. So, for example, you'll get people talking um, on the internet, um, talking uh, slick and negative about the left because they want to, you know, they, 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 they. for example, you even got some, some black conservatives talking about how wonderful black Britain, you know, Britain is for black people without knowing the struggle that got to be as good as it is for black people you see. And certainly now, I don't think though that the Black Lives Matter thing is connected to economic transformation the way it was in the, in the 80s. I don't, mm -hmm. I don't think they're linked. They should be linked, but I don't think they are linked. Mm -hmm. I don't see BLM creating the economic changes in the way that um, uh, the left wing and the activism, including the uprisings. The way that that produced outcomes for black people in the 80s, I don't see that being replicated now because the politics just isn't there.
with with the with the the other the other you know with the conversation now i mean people people are just tired now of you know the racism the discrimination and you know it's it, it, I think people are not, it's, it's just, they have no confidence, as we all know, in, in the system. So what are some of the solutions, economic solutions, we can start now developing and to move ourselves forward now? What, what are we actually now looking at here? The sad reality is becoming an entrepreneur is the only viable choice for a black person to reduce the amount of everyday racism that they face. Yes, you're going to get institutions being nice, but the being nice, as I said, is a two-week window of opportunity. Mm. If you want to something that's longer lasting than that, you are going to have to strike out on your own. Mm. Now, if you don't want to strike out on your own and a group of you want to strike out and create something cooperatively between you, good. One of the advantages of striking out on your own, though, is once you become an entrepreneur, um, other black entrepreneurs are going to want to help you and they're going to want to keep you off the plantation. And, if, and what will happen is, is if you scratch my back, I'll scratch your back, we'll keep each other off the plantation. And as an entrepreneur myself, I can tell you, real talk, black entrepreneurs do do that. You know, we do, we really do network with each other. We really do help each other. We really do put deals to each other. And you, you know, people listening to this want entrepreneurial. You can be a part of this. Mm -hmm. And while being an entrepreneur doesn't fix every problem the black community faces, at least your nine to five is a lot less horrible than it is now. Mm -hmm. um, being in a work environment where you have to watch your back, you're not going to be in that work environment anymore. Mm -hmm. And you are going to be around people who have an interest in you succeeding, because if you succeed, you're helping them to succeed. And the more people that succeed, the better uh, our world as entrepreneurs becomes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, because, I mean, the thing is about, again, is the, the more black businesses that we, that we, establish you know again there is there is that spin-off as well isn't it is that the building of that economic infrastructure that that will birth other other aspects i mean we're talking about employment we're talking about education so a lot of it is is, is hung on the fact that we need to develop our in economic infrastructure here to thrive as a people i agree i agree but it's not but we don't have to look at it quite like that because entrepreneurship isn't just business entrepreneurship is deals i can put deals to you you can put deals to me it doesn't mean we have to open up a shop front do you see and mm -hmm. once i put a deal to you you put a deal uh, to me we both have an interest in that deal working out because we both benefit and once you have a track record that you can produce you can deliver all the people are going to want to put deals to you other people are going to want to put deals to me, do you see? And then that's how you get genuine cooperation. That's how you get genuine, I scratch my back, you scratch, you know, I scratch your back, you scratch mine. You get that genuine, um, we need each other to make things happen. So it doesn't have to be um, opening a shop front. It doesn't have to be land acquisition. Does that make sense? Yes, it, it really does. does matter, it doesn't have to be that to produce a winning result. Absolutely. I, I, that's a, such a, a, a key and valid point. I don't think people have thought about it in that way, um, about an exchange of ideas um, and working together in an agreement, uh, which doesn't even necessarily have to have finance to it because it's about building up the infrastructure in every way possible and sometimes finances are not there. Time is also a, a product that could be um, more equitable than actual uh, physical money, which is a story sold to us in the first place. So um, I just want to shout out some of the people that are putting money into Got Push TV and supporting us on this station. Empress Chasha Black, we've got Tashika Ashe on Club, 
people giving money. We've got someone at the top there who's given some money as well. I, I can't see your name there, unfortunately, but we give thanks. This is all very, very helpful to keep this system going of sharing and um, putting our own narrative across and out there so people can see how what ways we can grow economically um, powerful. Back to you over in the studio, Shakara. I've got a question for, for Brother Robin here. Yeah? Um, and this one's a bit more theoretical. Now, obviously, yourself and Sister um, Esther before you spoke about um, infrastructure, yes, and economic systems and then kind of things there. Right? Now, on my bookshelf, Brother Robin, I've got a few books that are next to each other because of they relate to each other for, for me, right? One of them is Yorugo um, by Mama Rimba Ani. The other is uh, Introduction to Black Studies by um, Maulana Karenga. The, one is, the other is When We Rule by Reverend Walker. And last and finally, The Bible, yeah? Blueprint for Black Power by Dr. Amos Wilson, all right? So I want to read something quickly and get your thoughts on it, right? But just, just bear with me for a second. He says, in a chapter for, on race and economics, it is of utmost importance to keep in mind that an economic system is fundamentally a social system and a system of social relations. And um, an economic system cannot exist prior to or apart from a system of social relations, yeah? He also says, these socially related, created and sustained power differentials and arrangements tend over time, in, in, in parenthesis, and due to concerted propaganda and other efforts put forth by those who benefit most from the system to appear to the members of that society to be autonomous and natural. So a two-part question. The first one is, um, what kinds of, like you mentioned, um, social relations here, yeah? like how would we go about developing these social relations that, um, you know, help to develop the economy? And secondly, like, is it important to study and read like books on economy? If we yet to develop an infrastructure, how important is studying economics and economy and economic systems? And what kinds of, what reading would you suggest for our community to do in relation to those, those matters? Um, Unfortunately, you've asked so many questions. I know you think you've asked two, but you've actually, uh, you've actually asked a list of questions. I apologize. Which I can't possibly answer in that amount of time. I but let me, make, let me address what I think is the most important of the list of things that you just said. What's the most important? And that's this. Unfortunately, economics and business studies is mostly dishonest intellectual propaganda right and most of the books that are written on these subjects are nonsense unfortunately mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, that's an interesting take <laughs> yeah uh, and i can say this as someone with an economics degree from the london school of economics and okay. as someone taught uh, a level economics and business studies for years okay and how do you know it's nonsense is just go into a school and ask some basic questions. Ask the music teachers, can you guys write music? Chances are the answer is yes. Ask the PE teachers, are you guys really athletes? The answer is usually yes. Mm. Ask the art teachers, can you guys draw? Can you guys sculpt? Can you guys graphic design? The answer is usually yes. And then ask the business and economics teachers, do you guys run businesses? They don't know what the hell you're talking about. You'll find that a business or an economics teacher is just as poor as every other school teacher. And that shouldn't be the case. Mm -hmm. That's how you know the subject is nonsense. Mm. And what it is, it's designed to be the propaganda, to be the ideology. So it looks like this is how the society runs. That's not how the society runs. And what they actually do is keep how an economy works, truly works, secret from the masses. And what they put out as business studies and economics is nothing more than propaganda. That's why it's very difficult to read about economics and become rich, you see. Whereas logically, you can learn about music and be able to write music. You can learn the techniques of training and become an athlete. Do you see the difference? Mm -hmm. You can study past artists and become an artist. Doesn't work. Now, the reason is this. The real information of how to make money 
it's only really some of the motivationalists that have been able to put together some of the jigsaw pieces. They don't have all the jigsaw pieces. So the Japanese American guru, Robert Yasaki, he's got a jigsaw piece. The African American guru, um, George Sabira, he has a jigsaw piece. Um, the Polish American guru, Tihav Eka, has a jigsaw piece. Do you see? Mm -hmm. uh, what I'm trying to do is make it one of my life's goals to put as many of the pieces together so that we can take any young black person through a system, through a structure, and at the end of it, they end up rich. At the end of it, they end up with property. At the end of it, they end up with assets. But we're not in that position yet. All we have are big jigsaw pieces. But what's connecting the jigsaw pieces? We don't have that information yet. Right? Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Now, as far as the so, uh, what we should study, I do believe that um, people should be reading as much as they can about money and how it works. But be warned: if it's mainstream economics or business studies, it will be nonsense. Trust me on that one. It will be nonsense. So I do recommend people read George Sabira, Robert Kiyosaki, T. Harv Eker. Uh, if they want, if you want to keep it on a black tip, Dennis Kimombro, right? Try and get as many of these kinds of people, um, but get knowledge where you can can get it. Um, so my thing is, do that reading. That's very, very important. But the most important lesson that I can give you as an entrepreneur, once you're off the plantation, the work that you will do with other people the cooperative effort that you will have to put those deals together. Do you see? What you guys are doing right now on Got Kush, this is you putting a deal together. You guys are creating value with what you are doing right now. You see, creating value isn't something that just the capitalists do. We can do it. Every time you put an event together, you're creating value. Every time Leon Marshall and his sister put together a hidden uh, a Science Academy gig, they're creating value, do you see? And we can all, and we all have interest in putting deals together to create value. And the main point is we can pull each other off the plantation if we keep this going. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much, Reverend Robin. Sister Arima Art, we've got Sister Celine Akigwe um, up on deck and ready to go. So I'll, I'm a, I'm a, um, I'd like to wrap up with Brother Robin. Um, just let you know that we've got a sister Arima Ai in the back chat also. Um, you know, it's, it's funny. Um, because as a as a as an educator myself, it's, it's, I remembered um in my early days, um, and I, I was actually teaching business studies. However, my take on the business studies was more on 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 enterprise because that was the only way I could engage with my students. Now, my profile of students were predominantly young men, yeah? And they were in this particular course because they couldn't go nowhere else. So they, the, the college put them onto this business course to, to, to get a, a qualification. And, and actually you are right, because at that point, um, I already had developed um, a business and you know, were running a business part-time while I was actually teaching. And the curriculum does not allow for that type of creative mind, allow for the true entrepreneurial spirit to come forth. And I remember there was a young man um, in my class and, you know, he said, Miss, I know what you're trying to do. You know, I know you're trying to get us a qualification. I know what, but, and he went into his pocket and he took out money like this. But if you can show me how to make this, I'll stay. Basically, it's, 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 as far as it's concerned, it's like the, the, the system doesn't allow for that. So course, why am I in a system where I can go on the road and do that? Of course, of course. And, and my thing is, it may well be possible for us to create an education system that does allow for that, do you mm -hmm. see? Mm -hmm. And uh, as I said, I do respect the gurus that have come before me. Uh, but my thing is, is we can put all the jigsaw pieces together, then you could maybe create something like a five-year plan 
from zero to financial freedom in five years. If we can get it like that and then spread that around the community, you see, it will it will get rid of a lot of the discussions that we're having right now. Because a lot of us are under this impression that unless we get to own land, we have nothing. Mm. I disagree. As long as we have assets that's generating passive income, it doesn't matter if we don't own land. Do you see? Mm. If we can pull as many of our people off the plantation as possible, it doesn't matter if we don't own land. Mm. Because I mean, this way, we're in a position that we are making our nine to five, and we are not dependent on the system to make that nine to five. Mm -hmm. Once you get it like that, the amount of racism that you'll face on a daily basis declines because you're not having the interactions to face the racism. Do you see? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and people will say, but Robin, you still face racism. Yeah, but what type of racism would you rather face? Uh, a, a, a restaurant refusing to serve you or serving you last? Does that make sense? or your employer. Now, people say, but the restaurant is trivial. I agree. And I would rather have that trivial problem than the bigger problem of being discriminated against in the world of work. Do you see? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so, Robin, do you think education, going back to education, education is key at this stage? Provided that the education is either teaching you culture or is teaching you how to make money. Does that make sense? All other forms don't matter. Culture and money. Everything else is trivial. Culture. And that's why I'm calling for a radicalized education that is teaching adults culture and teaching the adults uh, how to become entrepreneurs. Interesting stuff. Family, um, Robin Walker has a, a Black Studies course uh, taking catering for three levels. And I think it, it, it would be a beautiful opportunity to um, to allow him to speak on that right now and how you can get involved. OK, there is a course that me uh, and some colleagues are running at the Croydon Supplementary Education Project. That's the charity that I work at. We are going to be running a course which will begin in at the very end of August, beginning of September. Uh, check out their website, CSEP, Croydon Supplementary Education Project, CSEP. Check that out. Also, if you can't wait till then, um, me and a colleague, Avril Nanton, we are going to be running a, a course on Black British history. And we're going to be concentrating on the last 70 years. The last 70 years, we, we, we're doing this to show, yes, I'm aware black people have been in Britain since Roman times. Yes, I'm aware black people were the first people in Britain. But that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the last 70 years to show the political, the cultural, the economic, the in, uh, uh, intellectual struggle that black people have waged in the last 70 years to show why you know that uh, the, the, the black conservatives talk about Britain is the nicest place for black people to live. What our course will do is show why that's true, because of our struggle to get it like that. Do you see? It's not because um, English people have been nice to us. It's because we've had to fight them at every stage to get them to treat us uh, the way that they treat us. Do you see? And what we, what I'm doing in that course is we're documenting that 70 years worth of struggle. So if you want to follow up on that, uh, Avril's Walks and Talks, go on her site and uh, check out the, the Zoom course that we're going to be running uh, starting uh, next week. Thank you so much. I just want to shout out big up to 9 Ether 99 for your contribution, your financial contribution there. And Nelson Evora, thank you so much for your contribution, your financial contribution there we see you we appreciate that here at got tv i'm handing it back over to you both shakara and sister ari who has been on for three and a half hours straight with me the men the man uh, them are going to be taking over for a little period um to start the break Get your teeth, get your teeth. I've, I've got my grapes and I've got my lemon juice. All right, all right, all right. I think you have to take your teeth, you know what I mean? All right, Robert Robin, thank you very much, bro. Um, well, as always, for joining us. Thank you. Know you. Thank you for everybody. Thank you for yeah, all you. Yeah, By the way, so go ahead, bro, go ahead. 
No, I'm saying have a successful day, you know, big things, big things. Thank you so much, my brother. And um, yes, we uh, what in terms of Wait, I, 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 I just want to show you something, yeah. I want to show off here yeah, my, oh. my, my Robin Walker collection, you know what I'm saying? Like it's it's large out here. You get me? Like my whole Robin Walker collection is moving mad. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So I'm just encouraging everyone, yeah. Like when we rule.com, it's Black Power Day. Yeah. Knowledge is power. So get a Robin Walker book. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like get a Robin Walker book. You get me? My Robin Walker selection is mad. Yeah. You can see what I'm doing. Yeah. You're winning right now. I'm not going to lie. I've got right? the one. And there's more. And there's, and there's more where that comes from. Yeah. So like buy anything by Robin Walker, ain't it? Anything. You know, you have to say anything. There's more. Yeah. So I'm just, I'm just, I'm just showing off, innit? I'm just showing off. All right. <laughs> Where's the Black History of the UK one? Huh? Uh, you're... Oh, you know what? I've 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 bought it, but it's at the school that, that I teach that, that I teach at the whole school. Oh, you're winning, hands oh, down. You know down. So yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So it's it's level. This level is out here. But big up, big up, Robin Walker. Thank you very much for joining us. And we're gonna let you oh, go now. Good. Yeah. Okay. Big, big up. Big up. Big up. Big nice one. Bye bye. All right. Bye -bye. Blessings to Robin Walker. We're gonna bring through our next guest. Are you black and proud? Are you cultured and know enough about your history to at least know you came from greatness and not slavery? Did you know that the wealthiest person in all history was a black man, Mansa Musa I of Mali, a 14th century African king? Black people are tired of feeling economically deprived. Have you ever felt that black people should have progressed in this country much more than we are currently? In fact, it seems like we're sliding backwards instead of moving forward. Are you tired of the lack of resources and feeling drained? Have you observed our communities being gentrified? Have you noticed our youth feeling like the elders never left anything behind for them? Now we have to start life from scratch. We are in a very depressed state as a result of all of these factors. We are creating an opportunity to empower our community to do something about this situation using one tool that gives us a fighting chance, education. With our new show, we intend to help our audience to be informed about the economic state of the black community and its connection to their lack of money. To be educated to a new solution paradigm, namely group economics. Find outlets and resources to practice group economics. You will also learn directly from top scholars and entrepreneurs about the paths to success. Learn more about the history of blacks and the black businesses in the UK. Learn where black businesses are located in the UK. Learn the code of conduct for practicing group economics. Learn directly from top scholars and entrepreneurs about the paths to success. It's a 30 minute show hosted by Diana Powell. Each week, she'll start with a weekly introduction to group economics. She will then bring on top scholars such as Robin Walker to discuss a historical situation in which group economics played a part. The likes of Shell Phoenix to discuss black people spending power and other spending behavior. Next, Charmaine Simpson, who explores the mechanics of group economics and what black people should be doing now. Lastly, weekly, the audience is introduced to actual businesses in the community they can support right away. We invite you to tune in to the Black Group Economics Business Show, the solution to the lack of money in the black community every month on Got Kush TV.